So um, I'm Dr. Amy Moore. I'm the Director of Science and Research for the GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer, which represents the recent merger of the Bonnie J. Adario Lung Cancer Foundation, which is out in the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as the Lung Cancer Alliance, which is based in D.C. And many of you were with us just a couple of weekends ago in D.C. for our National Advocacy Summit. Um, I think we're also supposed to talk about, you know, our background a little bit. So for, from 2008 to 2018, I lived here in Atlanta. I was part of some statewide cancer initiatives that had been launched by a former governor of Georgia, which focused on recruiting top cancer researchers to our academic institutions across the state. And we also created a statewide biorepository because we know that having access to patient specimens is often rate limiting for research, so we definitely focused on that. So it's thrilling for me to be back home here in Atlanta, I brought my husband and kids with me. They're going to the soccer game tonight. I will not be there, but it's fun for those of you who are lucky enough to get to go tonight. So thank you for being here. Um, you know, we work closely with all the oncogene patient groups and have worked closely with the ALK positives over the years. And it's just an incredible honor to be with you. We look forward to working with you, talking with you while we're here and beyond. So we believe in research. We believe in all of you. and. It's great to be here. Hello, I am Dr. Upal Basaroy, and I'm the Vice President of Research at Longevity Foundation. First of all, incredibly honored to be here and to be sharing stage with this incredible group of people. So in my capacity at the foundation, I have the privilege of working with all of you, with an amazing community of doctors, with the FDA. At the end of the day, what we want to do is to ensure that we change the outcomes of uh, positive lung cancer and the lung cancer community in general. So a little bit of my background. So I did not grow up in the US, so I came here for my PhD. So I trained, I, I grew up in India. I trained as a cancer biologist and as a public health scientist. And then I moved to the foundation uh, four years ago. And I'm incredibly passionate about research because I'm a nerd, but <laughs> I'm also incredibly passionate about lung cancer research, particularly because having lost an uncle in 2004, and he was diagnosed even before ALK was discovered. And then an aunt was diagnosed in 2014 who was able to benefit from, from biomarker testing and targeted therapy. So I, as a nephew, have seen what research can do. And that's why we are gathered here, to be able to drive this movement. And one of the other things that I'm particularly passionate about the ALK positive community is you guys are a global group, and the reality is lung cancer is a global disease. And we need all of us in this movement together. So hi, everyone. My name is Christine Lovely. I I'm going to cry, so I, I apologize in advance. Um, it is such a privilege to be here. And before I introduce myself, I just want to say that there are a lot of people who couldn't be here for a lot of different reasons, and one of those is my patient John and his wife Angie, and just big shout out to him because he couldn't be here today. So sorry, I, I am the biggest step, so I apologize. I'm definitely a crier and just really moved by the opportunity to be here. So I am a lung cancer physician. I work at Vanderbilt University a few hours from here. I also run a research lab that started in the study of ALK, and so that was really the basis for growing my career. So thank you all so much, because I wouldn't be a physician scientist and be running my own lab and if ALK wasn't the foundation of what I started studying. Um, just really privileged to be here amongst this amazing family and, and happy to help you guys in any and every way I can. Hello, my name is Vincent Lamb. Um, um, I'm a medical oncologist that specializes in lung cancer. Uh, I am. I just wanted to echo the thoughts from the people on the panel. It is such an amazing privilege to join you guys here today and this weekend for this 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 gathering. Um, it is truly inspirational, and it really has a direct effect on how we go about um, planning and and our research and seeing our patients. Um, my, a little bit about myself, I, medicine is actually a second career for me, little known fact, maybe. Um, I was a software engineer in Silicon Valley um, and had this, after about five years, had this crazy idea that I wanted to help people. <laughs> so I went into medicine, but it's been amazing because, you know, and that's, this is partially what brought me 
uh, to my interest in ALK, which is you know a, a background in bioinformatics and computational uh, biology, and so you know cancer, as Dr. Dennis mentioned in her awesome talk, is a is a genetic disease, is a genomic disease, and so uh, the ability to integrate big data, as it's called, um, and uh, to treat and, and, and research oncogenic-driven uh, lung cancers like ALK um, is just uh, a passion of mine. So um, I uh, was at MD Anderson for a little bit, um, where I met the amazing Amanda, um, and, uh, and very recently moved to Johns Hopkins. So I'm very excited to, to share some of the uh, research uh, developments that are coming down the pike. It's on a very tight schedule with what we have to tell you. Um, so luckily, you already know what I'm up here to tell you initially is that, as we just heard, there weren't a lot of good options for ALK patients up until 2007. You know, the traditional approaches were chemo, surgery, radiation. And so I just took a liberty, since many of you were with us in D.C. a couple of weekends ago, I borrowed some slides from David Carbone, who's a leading lung cancer researcher at um, Ohio State University. And that's just to show you some of the previous kind of trends and, and statistics around what lung cancer used to look like in the pre-targeted um, therapy era. So let me find my answer here. And so I'm just giving credit to Dr. Carbone, um, who's phenomenal. He's on our scientific leadership board as well. So let me see if we can go ahead. Pressing the arrow. This is, oh, there we go. So you guys know this. Lung cancer is by far the leading cause of cancer deaths for men and women. Yet we know there's this huge discrepancy in incidence versus funding. It makes no sense whatsoever. We need more funding for research, and that's why we were on Capitol Hill a couple of weekends ago with many of you visiting our legislators, making that request to restore funding to $20 million for the Lung Cancer Research Program under the Department of Defense. So, you know, we need to fix this. But we also know that the earlier we can detect lung cancer, the better. So here we can see, sorry, he's got lots of, sorry, let me go back. So we know if you detect it stage one, much better odds than if you detect it stage four, where the outcomes are much worse. So that is our ultimate goal, is to move that needle earlier, improve screening rates and, and everything that goes along with it so that we can detect, intercede earlier, give better outcomes for patients. We don't want to find patients when they're stage four. We want to get them as early as possible in the process. This was the reality before the era of targeted therapies. Really, for decades, platinum doublet chemotherapy was the, the standard. That was the option that was available. And you can see that it didn't really result in good outcomes. So if you look at the survival on the y-axis on the left versus time and months on the x-axis on the bottom, that curve is not very helpful. Um, and so we know that by three years out, you know, only about 5% of patients were living, um, you know, were alive at three years. And so still, that is where we were, and now we know that there is hope. We are seeing a lot of progress in targeted therapies and incremental improvements in outcomes. So again, it always sounds crazy to say there's never been a better time to have cancer, but it is a thrilling time for lung cancer research and the advances we are making. And so, you know, that's really my motivation. I trained as a basic cancer researcher. I trained as a, like um, the presentation this morning, I trained in hematological malignancies, studying really the molecular underpinnings of what causes acute myeloid leukemia. But so many of those lessons are, you know, transferable to other cancer types. And so when I go to these national conferences, going back and forth across the country, what I can tell you is that hope is real. I mean, we see it with our researchers who are doing the work, seeing the patients. It's a thrilling time, and there's a lot of hope among all of us who live and breathe this every day in the research community. So we know that we're making advances in screening and early detection. We want to identify those high-risk populations, diagnose screen-detected nodules, 
early stage disease, you know, we're improving our methods of radiation, adjuvant therapy, we're looking at some interesting combinations. Um, and so I'm just kind of setting the stage for what's coming. But in locally advanced disease, we're making tremendous progress in all these eras, areas. And with advanced disease, targeted therapy is offering a lot of hope for the out-positive community. So biomarkers, again, we heard it this morning, getting the right drug to the right patient at the right time. That's what we want to achieve and deliver for all of you. And this is just shows um, trends in lung cancer five-year survival for the United States of America beginning in the mid-1970s. And what you see is that curve is um, going up over time. And this really cuts off 2008 to 2014. So what we heard this morning was 2007 was the pivotal year for out research. And it's really only been within these, this last little over a decade that targeted therapies have come online, the immunotherapies beginning to come online. So we're hopeful that we'll continue to see this go up in the coming years. But it's really a combination of various things that's going to move the needle for the most patients. Again, that early detection piece and also advancing research to come up with new improved therapies that can save more lives. So we're on the right track. We still have a huge way to go. That's where continuing to champion research funding, investing in research is so critically important. That's where all of you can have a huge role in making your voices heard and advocating for that funding that we so desperately need so that these people don't lose the momentum they have in the laboratory. They're the ones who are going to save the lives. We're the ones who are going to help them do it. And you guys are going to help us help them. So it's all of us on the same team, and we're going to do this together. So I'm going to stop there. As Amy mentioned, Colin has us on a very tight schedule, and I'm going to try and stick to it. Otherwise, Colin's going to get very angry, and we don't want an angry Colin. We don't want that. So I'm going to like try and do justice to this very quickly. So I was tasked about talking about the out translocations, and Dr. Dennis did a phenomenal job in the morning talking about you know where we started and where we are at right now. So I'll just. Again, you know, talk a little bit about that, but also, you know, I'll wear my nerd hat on a little bit and talk a little bit about research because I, that's what I love doing. So, I, you know, as she mentioned, the first change in the ALK gene was discovered in 1994 in a type of cancer called ALCL, which is anaplastic, uh, anaplastic lymphoid non large cell non-Hopkins lymphoma. Yeah, it's a mouthful, and then. Fast forward to 2007, that's when we first discovered similar changes in lung cancer. And when this happened, I was actually a cancer biologist at the NYU School of Medicine, and I remember that this was absolutely revolutionary. It like completely changed the way people were thinking about not just research, but about drug development. And the reason why that's the case is, as again, Dr. Dennis mentioned, the first patient who went on a clinical trial with this ALK blocking drug, Zalcori, was in 2008. Now, if you see the time between the discovery and the first patient getting the drug, that's not normal. Like, usually you have the discovery and then you have, some you have the gene discovered and then you have some time in drug development. And so there's a little bit of a lag phase. Now, the ALK model was sort of revolutionary, not just for the lung cancer community, it was revolutionary for the drug development community that here is research that's happened before an alteration was discovered, and now we can actually bring these two pieces together to get a drug out to our patients faster than we've ever been able to do. So I think it was, it was a win not just for the lung cancer community, it was a win for the cancer community because it set up a new model for doing this kind of research. Now, Zalcori was approved by the FDA in 2011, as some of you, and actually most of you know, thanks to the presentation. But what's most important is that approval in Zalcori was followed by four new ALK drugs. Now, these are pills, 
that you take. This is not traditional chemotherapy where you go to your doctor's office and you get an infusion. This is a pill that you just take at home. So now we have five of these pills for alt-positive lung cancer. And now we are in 2019 and it's still, you know, research is happening. We'll see what we get from this year. But this actually just bears testimony to the fact that if you actually have research complementing drug development and vice versa, you can actually see progress. Now this is where the nerd in me comes to play. Now how is research evolving? Now what you see here is essentially a crystal structure of a complex between a drug and the ALK protein. So what researchers can do now is they can actually go right to the sub, sub, sub molecular level and see how a drug talks to the protein. Now on the left side, what you see is the Zycadia drug, which is those little beautiful lines in blue, how it's talking to the ALK protein. And on the right side, what you see is Alcensa also talking to the drug protein. Now I don't think you need to have a degree in biology to actually see this beautiful, beautiful interaction and just essentially understand how complex it is, how different it is, and more importantly, we can use this information for future drug development. And what you see, those numbers there, Y1179, those are essentially little parts the of the alpha protein. protein. So the alpha protein is a chain, as again Dr. Dennis mentioned, it's a chain of amino acids, and those little numbers you see, those are specific amino acids in the ALK protein. And what you see right there is a crystal structure of these drugs talking to those specific residues. And this is incredibly, incredibly important for drug development because we need to know how these drugs are talking to these molecules. So, of course, great, this is research, fantastic, but how is research translating into patient care? which then brings me to my last slide, and I call this my hope and reflection slide, and I'll tell you why I call it my hope and reflection slide in a bit. Now, the first part, the hope piece. Yes, you know, we have made an incredible amount of progress. We have our positive patients living longer. We have this concept of long-term survivors who are patients who've been alive for more than five years, which was unthinkable in 2004 when my uncle was diagnosed. We didn't have that concept. We also have very long-term survivors who are survivors who've been, been with us for more than eight years. Fantastic. But what's, I think, a key point to keep in mind is, I think with research, with better treatments, patients are living longer and better lives. And what do I mean by this piece of better? Now, I promise this is the last data slide I'll show you. So what you're actually seeing here is, so when patients were treated with this drug, Zycadia, and then they were asked how they were feeling. Now, that's an important point, because you know what? We only think of drugs as giving our patients longer lives, but I think quality of life is as important. You need to be able to go to celebrate your daughter's graduation. You need to be able to go and celebrate your son's wedding. That is an important part of these treatments, this quality of life. Now, what research has done it's, it's been able to give us this ability to have discussions about quality of life, which was not possible. Now, what you're seeing here is a graph of some common questions that patients were asked about how they were feeling after they were treated with Zycadia. And those little bars that you see, those little boxes, the longer they are, that shows improvement, and they are pointing downwards. That means that these symptoms have improved. And what I've just shown here is some symptoms, for example, shortness of breath. Now, that's a huge symptom in lung cancer, right? You feel breathless. These drugs, they improve it. Then pain in the chest, pain in the shoulder and arm, coughing, difficulty swallowing, hair loss. Our patients are feeling much, much better on these drugs. So yes, we are seeing much more quality as well as quantity in survival. And that brings me to my reflection piece. And I think that's where I struggle with every day. Yes, we have made progress, but we cannot get complacent. I think we have, a, we have a long way to go. I think the research has taught us, we know a lot today, and we have a great foundation to carry on this research, but we cannot stop. And that's why we're all here, and that's why all of you are here, because fighting alpha positive lung cancer is a team sport, and we have to do it together.
I just saw there's this really cute message up here that says, welcome, watch your time, and smile. I don't know who wrote that, but that's absolutely precious. Amanda, is that you? Beautiful. So I am actually not going to use slides. I, I'm just going to talk to you guys, and, and I'm tasked with talking about current research in, in the alpha positive space. So I'm going to have basically four categories that I'm going to talk about. The first is testing. We can make all the best therapies in the world. We can get to a cure. But if patients are not being tested for ALK in the first place, none of it matters. Yes. It has to start with testing. And I will tell you, that slide that said 50% of patients get testing, in my practice, I, I, I don't, the patients that I see in consultation, I'm not sure it's that, that high even. Um, and I bet if we pulled a group of oncologists, that they would probably have the same experience. This is probably not even up to 50%. But again, we can, we can develop the best therapies. We want to. We need to develop the best therapies. But if patients aren't being tested, none of it matters. And so testing, 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 testing. That has to be a hugely critical and important message. The second message about where do we need to go? Think about diseases like high blood pressure like diabetes, very, very, very common conditions that we all struggle with. We all know people who struggle with this. Do you treat those with one drug? No, absolutely not. Patients are often on multiple drugs for their diabetes or on multiple drugs to, to help with their blood pressure. We don't really have that yet in treating out positive lung cancer or even treating EGFR positive lung cancer or most of the other oncogene-driven lung cancers. One drug is probably not going to be enough. And sequencing drugs is probably not going to be enough. What we really need and where the field is going is what we call rational combination therapies. So putting together drugs, maybe even of different classes, that can really fight the tumor from different angles. Not, maybe not only just targeting ALK, but targeting other parts of the tumor biology. And there's really two goals of combination therapy. One is, can we overcome resistance? So imagine that you're on an ALK inhibitor, electinib, and then all of a sudden your tumor starts misbehaving, and we say, what are we going to do now? And that's where we may want to do a combination therapy of an ALK inhibitor plus another drug to get over that hump of resistance. And there's multiple drugs that we can put together and that we are putting together. And so there are the ALK inhibitors, but then there's different classes of medicines that we use. We use chemotherapy, and there, in, in my belief, there is still a role for chemotherapy in, in the management of lung cancer in general. There is immunotherapy and huge research going into why don't patients with ALK positive lung cancer respond as well to immunotherapy? And to be honest, we don't have great answers on that right now. And in, that's a whole source of discussion that I hope we can chat about as a group. Um, the third um, kind of big, broad class of medicines is other targeted therapies. So ALK is not by itself in a cell. It talks to many other proteins. And what if we target some of those other proteins that ALK is talking to? Would that be more effective as a rational combination therapy? And that's how we try to understand the biology to say, how does ALK work? Who does it talk to? What other proteins in the cell? How can we make these rational combinations with the goals of overcoming resistance to the ALK inhibitor? And even more importantly is let's present, prevent resistance in the first place. So wouldn't it be great if we ever, didn't ever get to a point where we said, uh-oh, your electinib stopped working, or uh-oh, your lorlatinib stopped working? What if we could give combination therapies that would prevent that resistance from ever happening? And that brings me to my third point, which is, understanding the biology. And so we can make all these combination therapies and bring them to clinical trials. But if we don't understand at the DNA level, at the protein level, what's going on in those cells, on an individual cell level, why is resistance even happening, then we're just going to be chasing our tails, right? We need to drive the biology forward. We need to understand how do the wheels turn in those ALK positive lung cancer cells? What's making them do all the nasty things that tumors do to grow out of control, to not die when they're supposed to? And just like a car, if you don't understand the mechanics of a car, the car's not going to run. If we don't understand the mechanics of how an ALK positive lung cancer tumor cell works, we're not going to be able to kill it. And so there has to be really deep biology to say, not just let's try a drug in the clinic, but more importantly, and occurring at the same time is, let's make sure that in the lab, we are saying what is making this engine run? Why is this tumor cell doing what it's doing? And it could be changes in DNA. It could be lots and lots and lots of other things. Biology is beautifully complicated, and our bodies were made to be incredibly resilient. 
which is both wonderful and terrible because we can find ways tumors can grow in our body and we don't even know about it, right? But I would argue strongly that we need to really push laboratory efforts to un make sure we understand not just, okay, the tumor is formed and here it is, but rather what made it get there in the first place? And now that it's there, how, how, does, how does the tumor wheels turn? What is the deep biology of that tumor, the deep dive like Esley talked about this morning, so we can really, really, really deliver the best therapies? My fourth message is ALK-positive lung cancer, as you all know, is not the only type of cancer that has ALK. And so wouldn't it be great if we could take this research and say, let's move it into other types of ALK positive cancer. So anaplastic large cell lymphoma was one we talked about this morning. There's another one called inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. That's a mouthful to say. We call it IMT. It's predominantly a, a tumor of children. Right now, about 60% of those tumors are ALK positive, but they don't have FDA approved ALK inhibitors for those children. And I don't think that's good enough. And a lot of that is because it's a rare cancer and it's been hard to push the field forward because of that. And I think that we as a community can help that community as well to really give them access to ALK inhibitors. 60% of those tumors have ALK in them and, and we can use the knowledge that we collectively have to hopefully advance that, um, that type of tumor as well. I think you know, we all have our impact on a daily level about what we do and who we interact with and how we affect positive change. And it is such a privilege to be here, and I really look forward to some exciting and lively discussion in our panel. I'm about out of my five minutes. Um, Colin, if you yell at me, you're going to have that beautiful accent yelling at me, so I won't be <laughs> too upset. Um, I welcome questions and really hope for some really exciting and robust discussion later. Thank you all so much. Am I doing it right? Um, I was tasked with talking about the future directions of ALK um, research. So my take on that um, means that I'm going to focus on immunotherapy. I feel very strongly that a major theme of what's coming down the pike in terms of investigational agents um, that have promise in ALK um, surround immunotherapy. And namely, that means how do we engage the immune system to better work in ALK positive lung cancer. Um, and a lot of, the, a lot of these investiga investigational agents are not ALK specific per se, um, because it turns out that the majority of lung cancer does not uh, respond robustly to the currently approved FDA um, immunotherapy agents. Um, so we take a lot of those same strategies and those can apply to ALK. But in ALK specifically, the, a major challenge that we've seen is that unlike some of the other non-small cell lung cancers, uh, there are, there's a paucity of uh, CD8 positive tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, the cancer fighting T cells that are coming in to the tumor that are arriving on the scene to fight the cancer. So I'm gonna sort of list some of the things, some of the approaches that are specific to trying to um, fix that problem that I think would apply uh, to ALK um, very strongly. So there's two main ways that we can try to bring more T cells uh, to help fight the cancer. One would be indirectly and, um, and, a, and a very effective way, and I see you Dr. Morganaki is in the, in the audience, in a very effective way and, what, and one that we believe very strongly at well, when I was at MD Anderson, it was, is radiation. Radiation um, accomplishes two things uh, for bringing T cells into, uh, well, accomplishes two things for helping uh, prolong survival in stage four um, lung cancer, specifically ALK even. Um, and it is the basis for the, the clinical trial that I started at MD Anderson um, with brigatinib plus in combination with, um, with radiation called bright star that we're trying to do with the radiation is in stage four lung cancer in patients who have had a good response to the brigatinib um, is to radiate or surgery, but primarily radiation um, to areas of disease that are still um, um, residual. And the hope there is to potentially knock out the persister cells that may be a source of these resistant clones. 
Um, but just as importantly, and in fact, potentially, potentially more importantly, is the immunotherapy effects. Because we know that radiation induces cell death, so-called immunogenic cell death, that actually um, awakens the immune system by releasing various inflammatory cytokines and such. So um, that is really the basis for using immunotherapy to, in, I mean, radiation to indirectly bring um, T, more T cells to, for instance, an alpha positive tumor. Um, chemotherapy, by the way, actually does very similar things, specific um, types of chemotherapy. So therefore, there is a lot of rationale for combining chemotherapy plus an alt-TKI, for instance, or even sequencing that combination with radiation. Um, of course, toxicity and such need, uh, need to be um, accounted for. In terms of a direct way to bringing more T cells in to the, onto the scene, there is a plethora of really exciting, novel, so-called adoptive cellular therapies, of which I've been working on, um, to basically force more T cells um, uh, to the tumor, whether they're sort of genetically modified T cells or naturally isolated T cells. Um, so for instance, one technology is CAR-Ts or TCRs, um, in which uh, we take um, white blood cells out from the patient's body, and we um, re-engineer them to, to really have in the T cell um, uh, receptor uh, the ALK um, protein, for instance. And so therefore, it will specifically target a particular type of lung cancer. Um, and then we reinfuse those, a uh, whole army of those that are grown out in the lab back into the patient. Um, this approach has led to uh, very durable responses and, and in some cases cures in the um, hemo hematologic malignancies like some lymphomas and some leukemias. Um, and so our hope is to bring that to the solid tumors which um, does have some um, challenges that the, the, the leukemias and the lymphomas don't quite have. Um, another approach would be uh, TILS, of which uh, Scott Antonia, uh, previously at Moffitt, now at Duke, he's sort of led the way in terms of TILS for, for um, lung cancer. And so this is very similar to the CAR-Ts or TCRs, but instead of re-engineering the T cells to re-infuse back into the patient's body, we actually isolate the T cells that reacted to the specific tumor in a surgical specimen and grow those out. And then re uh, uh, so you have, again, a whole army of T cells that are specific to your tumor. Um, and there's all sorts of other subsets. For instance, NK cells, we are, no we are realizing really plays an important role. So it's not just T cells. Um, um, and then, of course, there's personalized vaccines. Uh, and, and I think, uh, well, the Alk Group is actually fun partially funding, you know, an effort in the vaccine space as well. So these are all exciting cellular therapies that really aims to potentially address the question of, you know, what comes next after lorlatinib, uh, where TKIs uh, may, may, you know, the potential of T TKIs may be exhausted. Um, so there are a lot of challenges, as I alluded to, in terms of bringing these cellular therapies to the solid tumors. You know, when I was running the T cell therapy trials for lung cancer at MD Anderson, I saw firsthand that this is really a difficult problem. But I'm so optimistic that we are making progress towards solving each of those little problems um, because the innovation is just amazing. Just as one small example, and, and, and you know, the, the science is just so cool. Um, there's a new, there's a new um, concept here that's actually in clinical trials now in which um, important cytokines, which is basically food for your, your cancer-fighting T cells, important cytokines that we could not just give by IV, for instance, because it would be so toxic, because it would just cause a, just a, a global inflammation, um, are packaged into these nanoparticles so like, a, for instance, IL-15 is one of these cytokines. It's packaged, so, so, so there's a new concept now that, in which there's an IL-15 backpack. 
that's, that's, uh, so we take T cells out from a patient's body. We just wash them in this, this, this process in which we attach these nanogel IL-15 backpacks. And then we in, re-infuse them back into the patient. And these backpacks only release once the T cell recognizes the, you know, the, the cancer cell that it's, it's, it's targeted towards. So therefore, you get this localized um, um, dose of an important uh, cytokine food for your immune system. That's just one example of the cool things that are happening. Um, and I, so really, I have just a tremendous amount of optimism that we do have multiple options for life after lower latinum. So. Just wanted to say, uh, apparently we're able to stretch this out to 12.05. Uh, so uh, hang tight for Alice Shaw, but in the meantime, uh, we'll keep on going. I think Dr. Lovely and Dr. Lamb's talk are perfect segues into what I'm going to talk about, which is the three awards that the OutPositive community funded last year. And these are the three OutPositive Transformational Awards. And that name, Transformational, actually comes from a discussion we had with Dr. Ross Kamage when we were scoping out the award, and we were actually trying to figure out what we want to achieve from this, these awards. He said, we want to transform out positive lung cancer. So that essentially is the goal of these research awards. Now, I think you've heard a lot about this. So the current ALK toolkit, and I like to call it the current ALK toolkit, has mostly these five drugs, and yes, you know, we have chemotherapy as an option, and immunotherapy, as Dr. Lam and Dr. Lovely mentioned, has not shown a lot of success in the out positive lung cancer space. Now, there is a little, there's a hypothesis going out around uh, about why immunotherapy has not been that effective in out positive lung cancer, and one of the big hypotheses is that out positive lung cancer tends to be a cold cancer. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, Dr. Lam mentioned that for your immune system to, to recognize your cancer, you need these cancer-fighting T cells to be able to identify and then hone into the cancer. And so what you see on the right is a hot tumor, which is filled with these cancer-fighting immune cells. Now, what you see on the left is a cold tumor. Now, this is really a graphical representation. Your tumors, the tumor doesn't actually look red and blue, but it's, it's, it's for convenience. So you see on the right, on the left side, a cold tumor. You don't see all of these cancer-fighting T cells inside the cold tumor. But what you do see is some of these other immune cells, which actually block cancer-fighting immune cells from coming to the tumor. So these are these immune-suppressing cells. So alt-positive lung cancers are remarkably good at escaping the immune system, hiding from the immune system. So sort of keeping that in mind, when we discussed what types of grants to fund through the ALK Positive Transformational Award mechanism, one of the big goal was, how can we move the needle for immunotherapy in ALK Positive Lung Cancer? But before I even talk about the research, we need to talk about how these awards were selected and these awards were selected by this excellent committee of reviewers. We had five members of the ALK Positive community who are on the top, and you know most of them, and some of them are already sitting in the audience. And in the lower panel, you see this, this panel of experts, scientists, and doctors, and I think you recognize most of the names. These are all international experts in ALK Positive Lung Cancer Research. So this committee of reviewers identified which award to fund. Now you can ask them that this was not an easy process. This was an incredibly long process. We got lots of applications. The committee got together, they scored the applications, and then we got together in a study section. A study section is where everyone talks to each other, discusses these grants, and then we decided which projects to fund. Now, this was a very, very important part of the process having this combination committee because it was important to have members of the out positive community decide 
what research was meaningful to the community, and it was important to have the scientists in the, in the review panel as well, because they are the ones who were telling us, is this research feasible? Has this research already been done before? And what are we supposed to get out of this research? So I call this the, the magic panel, and because they really got together and made this happen. Now, this then brings me to what, who are the three awardees, first of all, and what do the three grants plan to accomplish? Now, Dr. Lamb talked a little bit about the ALK vaccine. So the first awardee, Dr. Mark, award from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, he's developing a vaccine for ALK positive lung cancer. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a bit. The second awardee, Dr. Justin Gaynor from Mass General, he's asking a very fundamental question. How do ALK positive lung cancers escape the immune system? It's a very important and a very fundamental question. And he wants to use this information then to figure out ways so that we can switch off those mechanisms of immune escape and make ALK positive lung cancer a hot tumor, essentially. Now, the third awardee, Dr. Rafe Nemenoff from the University of Colorado, he's using an FDA-approved drug, again, to turn on the immune system. Now, why do I mention an FDA-approved drug? This FDA-approved drug is a complement inhibitor, and I think it's important to note that it's an FDA-approved drug because we already have some data on this drug for safety. We know how patients respond to this drug, how safe it is. Now, the approval is not for ALK positive lung cancer. It's for another type of cancer. But we have a lot of collateral, a lot of information about this drug to build on it. Now, here you see the three awardees, but I do need to point out that they are not working in silos. They're working in teams. Dr. Mark Award, he's working with Dr. Greg Riley from Memorial Sloan Kettering, so they are a team. You have Dr. Justin Gaynor, who is a part of Dr. Alice Shaw's team. And you have Dr. Rafe Nemenoff, who works very closely with Dr. Ross Kamage at the University of Colorado. And this, again, goes, to, goes back to the point that Amy and I were talking about, fighting out positive lung cancer is a team sport, and we have to be doing this together. And I'll tell you a little bit about one of the awardees, Dr. Mark Award, what he's been able to achieve. Now, if you remember one of the first slides that I showed, which talked about ALK positive lung cancer being a cold tumor. So he's developed a vaccine for ALK positive lung cancer. And I want you to look at the left side. So that's what an ALK positive lung cancer typically tends to look like. So that's the, and by the way, this is work done in mice. Now we have to start all drug development experiments in mice to make sure that it's working before we bring it to clinical trials in patients. So on the left side, you see just a regular ALK positive lung cancer. Now on the right side, what you see is after these mice receive the ALK positive vaccination, this ALK positive vaccine, the tumor gets filled up with cancer-fighting T cells. So at least in this mouse model, we are able to convert a cold tumor into a hot tumor. And I think that's incredibly important that this vaccine is working in mice, but I also need to point out that this is still in mice, and we need to see how it works in patients, and Dr. Award is working in that direction. And the other two awardees, Dr. Gaynor, as well as Dr. Nemenoff, they also have done incredible work, and I just received their progress reports, and I didn't have the time to pull out data from their grants, but again, looks very, very promising. Now, where do we really want to go from here? Yes, these are research projects looking promising, great. But where do we want to actually go from here with these research projects? And this is what I think we want to be at. We want to expand that toolkit because we, we have all these drugs, but we need to keep on expanding our ALK positive toolkit because as Dr. Lovely said, sometimes cancers start misbehaving and they become resistant to some of these drugs. So we need to be ready with additional toolkits, tools in our toolkit so that we are ready. And that's what we want to do with these awards we want to see if we can add immunotherapy to this toolkit.